Hello. Um, today I'm going to be talking about Orientalism and Tibetan imagery. And I apologize, my throat is a bit scratchy, so <clears throat> I may be coughing a little bit um, throughout the presentation. But let's begin. So in order to adequately understand how Orientalism affects Tibetan imagery, I'm going to first define Orientalism. So this is a little blip from my paper. Um, this is the way I define Orientalism from the get-go. Orientalism, simply put, is a study of Asian cultures, specifically by Western scholars. These scholars are known as Orientalists, those who concern themselves with analyzing, depicting, and representing Asian identity, whether it concerns historical data, cultural phenomenon, or political affairs. Mm. So the little chart I have at the bottom represents the way I'm going to think about and develop our definition and understanding of Orientalism. So there's three different scholars. These are all their last names. And I believe that Hall sets a, a base for the way Orientalism is described by Lopez and Said. So starting with Hall, he is a scholar who has thoroughly researched discourse and has defined the way we understand discourse. Um, in his work, The West and the Rest, Discourse and Power, he concludes this knowledge, aka discourse, influences social practices and has real consequences and effects. Um, and discourse is defined according to Hall, as a group of statements which provide a language for talking about, i.e. a way of representing a particular kind of knowledge about a topic. So this orient, like, inform, informs Orientalist thinking um, because Western scholars essentially have a discourse or a way of thinking and representing and talking about Orientalist things or Oriental things, which sets the way people think about it and thus the, the social practices that people enact regarding Oriental things. And this is evident in Chinese <clears throat> government's of effect on Tibet, excuse me, because they have a somewhat Oriental way of thinking about Tibetans. Mm. And that thus affects the way that they materialize their thinking in social practices. <clears throat> Okay, so Lopez is our, sorry, Said is our first Orientalist um, scholar. So his quote that I found is that Orientalism expresses the strength of the West and the Orient's weakness. Um, this is a really great quote because um, in a lot of Orientalist thinking, because there is a discourse regarding the Orient <clears throat> and because it is a subject of a somewhat like higher way of thinking that looks down on them, it definitely does express the strength of the West and the Orient's weakness. And this is a results in a lot of negative consequences in the way the international community eventually and consequently mm, tries to help Tibet, which all, like ultimately aren't very helpful. And because they look down on, on Tibetans as like a weaker company, uh, sorry, not company, a country, it results in them looking down on them as if they're like almost a um, in need of help or like in need of like pity um, and as if like a bigger, stronger power is like coming over that can help save them essentially. So that's his way of thinking. And then secondly, we have Lopez, which is a very um, studied scholar who works at the University of Michigan. Um, he describes new age Orientalism. <clears throat> and again, there is this thing I just mentioned where there's a shift in tone throughout Orientalism studies over the years, where it seems like opinions of Tibetans have shifted dramatically. Sometimes Tibetans are depicted as peaceful and respectable, but other times they are viewed as rather problematic or uneducated. So again, it's as if this like higher power and their discourse <clears throat> surrounding this higher power ultimately, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm very sorry for <laughs> coughing. Um, ultimately results in the way people really believe in, think about such oriental things, AKA Tibetans in our case. So sometimes Tibetans are a victim, sometimes they're a barbarian. Okay, so Orientalism applied. Um, these are the questions we're gonna focus on today. 
How does Orientalism apply to, to Tibetans? <clears throat> and how does Orientalism apply to Tibetan women? So in my case, we're gonna focus on the way it applies to Tibetan women. So in analyzing the images, um, this is like our methodology. Um, we're gonna take the, the definition of Orientalism that we have and combine it to this way of analyzing that I'm gonna describe on the slide. <clears throat> and then we're going to conclude in what that means for oriental, oriental depiction of Tibetan images. Um, and that's where we'll get kind of our conclusion, AKA like thesis and answer. <clears throat> so we are going to focus on subject, color, angle, line, and composition. And these all play into the um, way we're gonna analyze the image because they obviously all have a very big part in the photos we're gonna be looking at. Um, specifically like the subject and also the angle. So looking at the gaze of the subject is very important because it expresses a lot of different emotion and also power dynamics. Mm. And another big thing I'm going to be talking about is the color. <clears throat> All right, let's move into image analysis. So, so our first source comes from My Tibet by the Dalai Lama and is published in 1990. All right, so our first photo is really focused in on this young uh, Tibetan woman's face. <clears throat> That's the first thing I noticed when I looked at this. And there's a really strong reddish hue to this photo. <clears throat> Again, this is not, um, I'm not sure if it's edited or not, but I believe it is because this is like very red tone coming out. And when I was looking at this image, it came off as kind of a political meaning, possibly in understanding visual literacy, there's a way of looking at a metaphor and understanding what it could mean. So. For me, I connected it possibly to like the Chinese flag and how it's red. Um, and that kind of red color draws you into that face and then thus you bring it to like the eyes of the woman. And as we can see, like <clears throat> she's looking away. She's not focused on the, the person, like the photographer, they're not looking at the lens. It doesn't seem like we're looking down at her, but yet again, we're not looking up. So it's as if like, they're gazing past us. Um, the expression on her face is um, almost very like sad and, well, not sad, but very like, like in, she's looking in the distance. So she has like a very, I don't know, like pressured or maybe strained look on her face. It's definitely not a positive um, emotion. Mm. So the red color ties us into her face thus narrowing in on her expression. And because of this, I thought maybe it shows like the pressure of like the Chinese government on Tibetan people and also specifically Tibetan women were often like get the most of the Orientalist way of thinking, which is gonna be further shown in the next few slides. So our second photo is this image of a Tibetan family. There's a lot going on here. There's a lot of components. Um, to break it down, we should look at the background, middle ground, and foreground. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Um, so the background has uh, a couple of children and then the older man holding an image of the Dalai Lama. The middle ground is like the old woman. Um, I guess also kind of the old man. It's a tie, they're, they're kind of connected there. <clears throat> In the foreground, which is highlighted by the lighting coming from the left side. <clears throat> is the young woman or not, well, middle-aged woman, I guess. Um, so she's the focus of the image, she's our subject and they all have a kind of peculiar look on their face, but especially the woman of focus. Mm. Again, she's not smiling and it looks, she looks kind of forlorn. Um, <clears throat> and the key thing is that she's breastfeeding and I think that really stands out in this image, especially with the light on her. Um, but she looks very like, again, like this weight on her, like a physical work. Um, and the fact that this photo takes place inside the house where um, a, a woman, like a woman in a nomadic family would have to take care of a lot of different things throughout the house. And it's very stressful. And 
demanding job that like day in day out requires a lot of work. Um, so I think that this points to like the pressures of a Tibetan like um, woman, especially in a nomadic family, because they have a lot of things they need to do every single day. Um, and that can put a lot of pressure on them. I also think the fact that she's breastfeeding can also look to the way um, women may be seen as just simply means of producing more kids or like more of a like sexual or birth giving object, I suppose. Um, and lastly, I put in the color aspect because the like the brown tone is a very big contrast to the red tone we saw before. And I think it could also like hint to just like the, the lifestyle of like the Tibetan nomads. Um, but in general, this piece, I think more depicts like the pressure of like raising children and like the constant tasks like required of women um, and specifically like just kind of looking at them as like means of reproduction and children and domestic life. Okay, sorry. The last source is from um, Performing Tibetan Identities, which was a like, I guess a series of photographic portraits by a young Tibetan artist. And it was actually depicted at Oxford. So there's like two comparing images that are used to illustrate a message. So let's get right into it. Um, so this is the last, I guess, image, but it's technically a set of images that we're gonna use. Um, we're gonna keep the main in, uh, text in mind. <clears throat> what does this comparison tell us about the way traditional Tibetan women are perceived? So starting with the image to the right, um, the young woman looks outgoing or kind of like aggressive, just like the way her teeth and mouth are. <coughs> and her posture is very like open, relaxed, and she seems like very confident. And I think that her like nails and her jewelry are almost em emphasized and like the way her hair is really done up and like her coat is very nice. Um, and also like the gold on her neck is very, um, like it's very like, it's very like shiny and it's kind of emphasized again like with all these different pieces she has and then if we move to the photo on the left she seems very like serene calm like almost polite and docile because her posture is very put together her back is straight her hands are together on her lap in like a very polite manner and like <clears throat> that you know that her beautiful hair is like put back a very like modest hairstyling minimal jewelry um And she also also she also looks a little bit more submissive, like she's kind of looking up at the camera. Um, and as we can see, her makeup is still very like visible. Like her eyelashes are obviously very like done up still. And I think that's like the main part that stayed the same between these two images. But I think as we're like building along these images, these three uh, sets of images that I brought for you today, this one is specifically like specifically expresses. Um, kind of like the <clears throat> like almost submissive nature of women that is kind of depicted in or oriental depiction of women um, because they're often like sexualized or seen as more submissive and like uh, docile and also like a uh, object of beauty. Um, so like all those different topics come together. If you look at the other fo uh, portraits in this set of portraits by the um, by the artist, like the men are more like depicted as strong and and um, like their their muscles are emphasized and their different like objects of use and their like nomadic lifestyle. While the women, specifically this portrait, which is why I selected it, uh, depicts them more as beautiful, um, like calm, put together, and like very serene, almost yeah, you know, just like an object of beauty specifically. Um, which is a great way to end the images that I brought for you today because I think it specifically uh, really hits that, that point home. Um, while the first two are tied into that topic, I really do think this one is like the most clear about it, specifically since there's like a comparison between modern and also like, I guess, more traditional, like nomadic uh, lifestyle kind of Tibetan image. Um, so, Oopsie, sorry, the slides keep moving around. So the conclusion, um, 
basically what have we learned from this this presentation and again i apologize for the amount of coughing um so orientalism and how it applies to images of tibetan women through an orientalist lens tibetan women are often uh, firstly objectified into things of beauty um, sexualized or eroticized represented as submissive or docile and lastly tied into the weak tibetan experience so <clears throat> basically the first uh, object like objectified point i think really is very clearly um, depicted in the last image i showed and then sexualized um, or eroticized is shown also in like the last two um, represented as submissive or docile. Honestly, it could be in all three of them, but I think specifically more in the last ones. But uh, yeah, um, and tied into like that representation of sub as submissive or, do or docile is um, kind of like that idea in the second image where we had just seeing women as a means of like reproduction, just like a useful like thing to like take care of the house, I guess. Um, and lastly, like tied into the weak Tibetan experience, um, I mean, women are normally seen as like weaker, so uh, they could be tied into like the grander scheme of like, you know, we are the West, we're like this Orientalist like studiers, and you are like the Orient, um, and we're like you're weak compared to our like discourse way of thinking, um, which can be seen uh, specifically in, like the first image in the way that I have developed that argument. Um, yeah, that's our main points, um, and specifically regarding uh, the images of Tibetan women. Um, and then lastly, I have my sources. So I have a lot of these different things in my essay, but specifically um, the images of uh, my Tibet from the Dalai Lama, and then uh, performing Tibetan images, and also like the Saeed, Lopez, and Hall sources. So the only one not represented is the Hopkirk source. Um, Thank you for watching my presentation. And again, I'll apologize for the last time. Sorry for the coughing.